John Wick Pinball. So um, let's just start off by introducing our, ourselves. Um, I'm Elliot Eisman, the lead game designer. We'll just go down the line. Uh, hi, I'm Charlie Benante. I did the music for John Wick. <laughs> I'm Tim Sexton. I'm the lead software engineer for John Wick. Uh, and Josh Henderson, game software developer for the game. And I don't, I didn't get any cards, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It makes two of us, buddy. I can't believe that you didn't get cards either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is, um, this is the, the our panel here, but um, it takes a lot more than that just to make the game. As you can see, um, um, one of the people that's not here is uh, that is really was really uh, uh, crucial was uh, Robert Blakeman. I wanted to give a shout out for him because he did all the mechanics for it. Um, but yeah, it just it takes so many people to make these things, and this is um, kind of a, a list of that. Um, so we'll we'll get into the start of the project. And I'm going to take it down in what kind of a chronological order of how we do this um, game and just pinball pinball development in general. And then you know when you guys want to chime in as far as you know add some fun anecdotes, feel free to stop me or whatever. <laughs> Uh, but the project kicked off in actually January of 2023, and the um, interesting fact here is actually Tim actually started this project. I don't know if you want to go with your uh, earlier interactions on that. So one of the first things I did was I tried to figure out John Wick's primary firearm and if a coil <laughs> could fit inside of it. We quickly realized that would not be possible in this game. But I had been a big fan of all the John Wick films, and when the opportunity came to do it, I was like, as George and Gary always say, the team has to want to work on it. I really wanted to work on this game. Uh, it was one of those things where it was like the first John Wick movie. No one had really heard about it. I saw it at a friend's house, and then every other movie, I watched it the day it came out in theaters. By the time we got to John Wick 4, I had seen the screener a few times. Of course, people on the team yeah. got access to it because Jody's awesome, and had a great relationship with the licensor, and then I watched it the day it came out in IMAX. I watched it the day after it came out in IMAX, and you know, just studying everything. I just really was a big fan of, fan of the franchise. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. Going back to that, we kind of started with John Wick one through three in mind. We actually didn't know anything about John Wick four at the time, but when we started planning, it came out, and that's what um, we'll go into that a little bit later. But yeah, we got to see an early screener, and it's really kind of cool. And this is a fun picture because we were working um, right after uh, Jaws came out. So with their prototype, we uh, had <laughs> Wick popping out of it. <laughs> Which I think it would be the other way. Yeah. I think John Wick <laughs> could kill Jaws. Oh, yeah. I think we'll just say that right now. <laughs> so uh, when I started any any sort of design, either be it mechanical or um, uh, now, now pinball designs, I usually start with uh, blank, blank play field sketches. Um, usually a scaled down version of that. And so these are just my early concepts of just figuring out where stuff goes. So just where the ramps would go, where the um, where stuff would go. Like we, we knew we wanted a few elements to pick out. I or at least had in my head, I'm like I need a continental because that's a big franchise, you know, center of the thing. And then, um, you know, we couldn't do the, uh, the pinball firing gun mech that Tim was working on, but um, we had, we had other concepts, but, and then one of the discussions that me and Tim had early was like, well, what if we do, he's always battling stuff. Uh, we're always, you know, he's always fighting things. So we're like, what if we do like a kind of a battlefield area s similar to, um, uh, what's that game? No, I'm blanking on that. WrestleMania? Not, not WrestleMania, but um, the battlefield oh, in Shadow. Shadow, yes, yeah. that's it, Shadow Battlefield. So I, I kind of was, I liked the WrestleMania slingshots. So we're like, what if we adapt that? into some sort of thing where you're battling enemies, have drop targets behind that, something like that. So that was the first thing I actually worked on was that um, that concept. And here's a here's a, a, vid or a little video of what that looked like and then kind of the placement of it. Maybe we do a ramp shot into that um, and I'll show you the video. Uh, it was kind of fun, but it was a little, I don't know, it, it wasn't as fun as I'd like it. And my, my philosophy on the mini play fields is that you have to really, uh, it has to. You have to want to be up there. You have to. It has to be a lot of fun and engaging. And it just, it just didn't feel as fun as we'd like. Um, but it, we iterated a couple times, and actually it ended up being we took that concept and then shoved it in where the dance club actually ends up being. 
A, a big thing about working on these games, too, is you have to try everything in real life. You can have the coolest idea in the world. And he put it on here, and you can see kind of getting it, but it just wasn't there. We, we needed to take it to the next level. Yeah, that's a big, that's a big thing in pinball is just design, iteration, see if it's fun, then go on and repeat. <coughs> video <laughs> so now at this point where we kind of figured out okay we're, we're gonna make that <coughs> we still haven't cut it yet we're gonna make that mini play field and try to figure out all the shots around it so this is uh, some early cad that we went through uh, this is the first layout where i have it you can see it's the same layout and then it it becomes a little bit more real there's a continental on the side coming in now and then this is the um this is the actual like first prototype we ended up building this is what the cad looks like for me i i work in solidworks i know a lot of designers work in um autocad or stuff like that but because i came from a mechanical background that was more comfortable for me um, and it was about this time that we got introduced to this gentleman on my left and we had this um this meeting with jody so i don't know if you want to talk about that and your experience on how you got involved uh, I got involved. I mean, I've known Jody for quite a long time now, and um, I've been a pinball fan for many years. I own a bunch of pinball games, and uh, Kiss being the first game that I ever bought um, many, many years ago, and I've just always been intrigued by it. And one day I said to him, who's doing the music for these? And he's like, you want to do the music? And I'm like, yeah, of course I want to <laughs> do it. And the first thing he hits me with is the John Wick one, and I'm yeah. like, oh, okay. You got the wrong person <laughs> for that. <laughs> um, but I listened, I watched every John Wick movie over and over again and got a vibe for it. And then working with Tim was really, really great and yourself. Yeah. And the guidance that I got and the focus that I got from them, and I just went and just did it. And it was, like, so rewarding. You going to say something? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, so the nice thing about being a programmer on these games is that while Elliot's trying to figure out how the game's going to exist, I'm in La La Land, so I'm just watching the movies <laughs> and I'm taking my notes of like what's cool in the movie, and watching the movie so many times, you learn all the lines. There aren't a ton of lines in John Wick, mostly yeah, and then <laughs> you learn all the music cues and you kind of get a feel for the way you know a scene is set up and the action of the scene and the pacing of the scene, and I just took notes on like. These are my favorite tracks. These are my favorite scenes, and hand it over to Charlie. I was like, I like these themes. Yeah, and that's and I just ran with it. And the thing that that I was trying to do is tr how does this translate to playing with a ball? Like, how mm -hmm. are people going to get excited? Yeah. But if I was getting excited making this music, and I could envision how it would be played while you have certain songs being played, it motivates you to just get more aggressive with the game and. Um, and then I would send it to to them, and, and they would come back with, "This is great, yeah, this is great." So I knew I was awesome. on the right track. Yeah. And uh, I just had fun with it, and um, I hope you guys did. Does you you guys know the game at all? <laughs> <laughs> Have you played it before? Like, oh, I, we were in the Jaws. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you 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 were awesome to work with, and like you nailed it. I, I know. Like right out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was so cool. I was just jamming to it, like. Constantly while working to the game, like okay, yeah, I don't think we did any real revisions for it. No, I don't think we we didn't do any revisions, but um, I think I came back to you one time to complain that I only had like 32 minutes of music <laughs> out of oh, yeah. 40. Right, we need 40 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> so. And like the be, uh, and then but then John Wick and Four had come out, so then there was more. There was more, from yeah, that. yeah. Um, Right, but there was no revision. You just needed more music yeah, for it, yeah. um, because four was coming out, and there was different music in it. So we incorporated that within uh, the realm of the of the game. So I think you saw the screener, and even the music from the screener to the final had changed. Right, and that had even changed our. <laughs> right, and I remember watching the screener, and it and it didn't have all the effects in it, and you'd see a scene with like a, just a green background. I'm like, what the. Was that was that going to be the final movie? Right. But of course it wasn't. Um, and so now now we're on to the uh, Whitewood One development. So this is just a build up of how we usually build a play field in our lab. We call them Whitewoods because they don't have artwork and they sort of look white. So that's why when we reference all these Whitewood stuff, that's what we mean by that. But you can see kind of build up and chronos go um, a little bit order here to get to the next. Step and this is where actually like Tim actually you can see on the picture on your right 
this is actually in Tim's office, and he finally got to add some code to it for the first time. Yeah, and there's some basic things we need to do, like there's a lock mechanism. The ball's just got to put a ball in the right. lock, kick it out of the lock, just to keep the game moving, or else you play a six-ball game, all six balls get lost, and you can't play Yeah, anymore. and this was really important for early and really killing this upper play field because then when you actually wrote – um, the stuff for it, it was just like, wow, this is just not great. And then we we popped another one on. No, this is not great. And then we eventually like, oh, it's got to be the dance club. Yeah, it looks cool, but then ultimately, you know, it just had to go a different yeah. direction. Um, so now now we're we're engaging more the licensor. So this is, I think, this is right after we had our first meeting with them, where we learned most of our our rules of engagement with them. But I knew we had, I think we had 14 characters already in the project. So this is the, they, I think they came with a list to us. Is that how that worked? I started with a list oh, to yeah. them that had a lot of people. And then they were uh, pretty quick on getting people. And then they started getting people from John Wick 4 as well. So it was a back and forth. Yeah. yeah. So th this was, at this point, this was our already approved list of characters. So we knew we had a ton of content to put in the game, a ton of footage to put in the game. And it was already getting really excited. Shout out Jody Dankberg for <laughs> making this the most like asset packed game ever. <laughs> how many how many um uh, minutes of footage did we have? Forty five. Yeah, it was yeah. ridiculous. Um and this that is Lions Gate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was Lions Gate. Yeah. Um but this is now this is more of a Tim section here. <laughs> yeah, so this picture looks cool, but it's actually cooler than what I do. Mostly yeah. I just make Word documents that are really boring. <laughs> but in one case I I did like a flow chart to kind of show visually what's going to lead to what else. Everything on here is subject to change at this point in the project. So this is between that first Whitewood buildup and the next Whitewood coming in. And also at this time, this guy next to me here, Josh Henderson, <laughs> was hired by Stern Pinball and he had just completed his degree, his computer science degree. And um, he, as a young child prodigy, was in the finals <laughs> of the world championship like every year back to back. And then he took some time to go to school, and then he came to us with all this pinball knowledge and all this game knowledge. So some aspects of this chart, like, hey, there's car multiballs. There's somewhere on here. I really handed the details over to Josh and just said, like, you run with this mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, the way that this uh, project kind of ran uh, was sort of similar to how uh, Tim worked with Raymond on Rush and Led Zeppelin, how kind of we had a skeletal framework of the rules and then he would just uh, allow you to kind of have a sandbox to play in. So, like, for example, with the, the consecrated multi-ball where you spell Winston and then shoot the center ramp, we kind of knew that was the rule for the, the locking balls side. But as far as for, like, you know, the actual multi-ball rules, he kind of let me play around with it. Um, and kind of my approach when kind of programming on this game is my first project. Um, and I guess, like, my rules philosophy or design philosophy will change as I keep getting involved with more projects at Stern, but my approach was try to look at the footage that we had access to and just constantly ask myself, you know, how could I utilize this play field and the shots in interesting ways to not only make the modes just varied, but also just kind of make you feel like you're John Wick. You know, I wanted to integrate the theme as much as possible with the time that I had to help out with this project, and I'm happy of what I was able to contribute. Yeah, I think you did a really good job on your first project, like just running with it. It was great. This is just some more like it, we're we're still like constantly interacting with the licensor, but um so yeah this is just a note that they you usually just approve they have to approve all the content in the game but they also give us really cool stuff like um another shout out to Jody you worked really hard with the, the licensor and they gave us actually a cool um actual um mo uh, prop from the movie which was the marker we actually got to hold it and scan it which was really awesome and I was kind of nervous because I'm like if I lose this this is a lot of money. Only see only ten thousand, <laughs> so I didn't want to pay that bill, so I was really careful with it. But then they also this is what we're the screener we're talking about. So because we had uh, never seen John Wick four, and we just had literal at this point just placeholders like I don't know, we'll we'll one through four might go here or four will might go here. So this is where we got the screener, um, and it was really kind of cool to see that initial and thing. The story of why we got that screener was the first thing we had in the meeting was. There's going to be a big continental at the middle of the game. And they're like, uh, <laughs> You're like, wait. you sure you want to do that? We're like, yeah, it's so cool. <laughs> like, well, maybe we should show you something. Yeah. 
So spoiler alert, if you haven't seen John Wick 4 yet, they uh, they blast it to smithereens in like the second scene of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> We kept it in because it was important to one to three. So. They imply it's going to be rebuilt at the end. Yeah. We're like, you never know. Uh, so that's why we have two sets of lights in there. We have a red one and a white one just in case. <laughs> uh, so now now we're actually engaging with our artist, uh, Randy Martinez. And um, the way he usually works, and this is some early compositions. So he, he likes to put together compositions of the artwork just to get size and placement and, you know, the look and feel of uh, – kind of the layout of the whole thing so he's uh, the art process always starts with the back glass it's the most defined area <clears throat> so he, he does these are some early photo comps of what we what we had and um the one the upper one to your right is the we started with that imax movie poster we really like that imagery so that was one of that concept and then the the one to the left of that is actually what became our premium back glass and then at this time, we, were, we, we liked a couple of them, but we didn't like all of them. And he's like, well, what if I have this idea about like a stained glass? And so he went and did this like, what, it was like over a couple of days. And he's like, I got to show you what this looks like. And we're like, oh, this is cool. Uh, we just got to make sure we can sell it past our, our internal team. And so he made this first uh, composition of what it would look like. And so this is the, this is what it started as uh, for the backlash, and it kind of got uh, rejected internally because it didn't look super good. Um, but then but then it iterated into what you see it is now today. And then he loved putting the dogs in the bottom. Um, unfortunately, the licensor didn't like that so much, so we put the marker. <laughs> Well, also, the uh, Latin phrase was justice for the dog or yeah, revenge yeah. for the dog. <laughs> <laughs> we, we thought that was cool, but it ended up being his back tattoo. Uh, so now here's, here's a little cat, cat update. So this is after we sunk the upper play field into the dance club area. We kind of went back to the drawing board a bit. This is where we're starting to lay out inserts and try to figure out, okay, what do these actually shots really mean? You know, uh, Tim initially said okay we want to have these enemies it's kind of constantly killing enemies so we came up like we had probably three or four meetings about what this shape of this uh, insert layout looks like because we wanted to make it as tight as possible but physically being able to be made and not so big that it's taking up a lot of shot of uh, space so here's just some uh, iterations through that CAD and how it's it um, progressing so this is this is now we're building our whitewood, what we call the whitewood two. We usually do a couple different, or at least three prototypes, and then we go to our final production. So here's what that whitewood three uh, two looks like. And you can see it being built up. Actually, this was an interesting time at Stern because we were moving. So at the time, we actually didn't have a wood shop. So I actually took and routed this playfield by hand in our new wood shop um, by just like literally carving a play field out. So this is, it looks very homebrewy because that's literally me building it and 3D printing ramps. I'll talk while you're drinking. Yeah, thank you. The uh, reason I got so married to the enemies idea was one, just watching the movies. If you really break down a scene in John Wick, especially that overhead scene in John Wick 4, mostly it's about John Wick getting from one end of a building to the other end of the building <laughs> while constantly being attacked. And he has to kind of go from point A to point B and they really set up the way that scene looks and everything. And two, there was this like independent John Wick video game. It was a very, like one or two people worked on this thing. It's called John Wick Hex. And it was a really cool idea where you play as John Wick, but you every decision you kind of make that decision and there's constantly enemies of different sort of sight lines around you. And you're supposed to play it back and it looks like John Wick's action. And um, there was this video I saw in one of the DVDs where they brought this developer to the studio and they had him like being thrown around on the mats by all the stuntmen and he was just covered in sweat after. And I was like, that looks awesome. I would love, they never invite us out to the studio, but yeah. um, it really got a taste of like, the action is so critical to John Wick that you always have to be fighting. Um, here's some early uh, videos of what that white, Whitewood 2 looks like. Um, as you can see, the 3D printed ramps don't work super well. <laughs> so went to metal i think that's a good choice but just just testing out different the different mechanisms you know 
seeing how it would feel. Um, this is this eventually became the crate. Um, I didn't have what that mechanism looked like, so I just said, "Oh, we'll just put a shot going to this thing there." Right, my video is okay, and this was just a fun iteration of. Uh, GIF that I made of me actually building up the white wood in the lab while we didn't have um, or a uh, wood shop. Uh, th and this is our, our, our first presentation that we did um, with all the chaos of the moving. We hadn't had a lot of attention internally for um, reviews and stuff. So this was one of the, the first we uh, shows that we did to our internal uh, people to kind of show off this is the progress of the game um, this is more or less what the complete look uh, games looked like i think it all, at this point basically i just had charlie's music in there yeah. and i was selling the pitch basically by playing music yeah exactly <laughs> along as we were throwing the ball around this place exactly and then um you can see up there the left here we had we had four uh, leading concepts of what the pre the models would be. They weren't identified what they would be at all yet, so we're just kind of like trying to fe feel it out. Um, and then uh, this is a big thing that we do here is I think Keith talked about it before we were in that presentation, but and then also with that mini playfields, you iterate for fun. So I had this entrance to the shot. I it was it felt like it wasn't going to go in there very much, so I like took and twisted it a bit, and it was in there for that way for a long time until it didn't work at all, and then we eventually went back to straight. But there's a big uh, mark on iteration here. Um, and about this time now, we're, we're actually engaging in now the speech. Uh, so initially, we, we had a big deal to do the speech of, with Lance Reddick, and unfortunately, he had passed by the time we got to this, this point, and it was unfortunate news. Um, so we were going to have Sharon, and we hadn't identified the second character as either DJ or an operator. We weren't sure yet, um, but because he had passed, that we had to pivot, and um, we eventually were able to sign a deal with Ian McShane. And so we end up doing having two characters in the game, uh, Winston and the operator. Well, Tim, we want to talk a little bit more about that. You click your next one. Okay, I'll click my next one. So then we got uh, Eric Lederman, who uh, is a producer on Late Night with Seth Meyers, and he's also a huge, huge pinball fan. It's always cool to have people who are incredibly talented in their profession, and they also like pinball, and they're willing to you know, work with a relatively small... I mean, he's on primetime television every night, and he's going to work with us. So he wrote a script, and he really got... He loved John Wick. He really loved um, writing for Winston, the character, and he also loves adding... Humor. So I think there's a line in there that's my favorite. You once killed a man. You, ki you once killed three men in a bar with just a flipper. You'll be fine with three balls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is kind of your next slide too here. This is the we're starting the LCD development. You wanna tell your your philosophy on the UI? Oh yeah. Um. So right as I sit there in front of my computer while well, it's in the lab, like actually making a pinball machine. And I'm just kind of throwing ideas around. One of the ideas was, it would be cool if there was a way that your progress on the game was actually connected with what John Wick did. And, and because of all the enemy inserts, I really wanted to tie in, you know, if you're doing better, I want you to see more of John Wick doing better. And I came up with a new video playback system, and it's all complicated and only really makes sense to the other programmers at Stern who understand our system but i basically have two video players and i'm constantly swapping between them and it's a thing that only i do and i keep doing it on my on all my games because of minute technical details that i like about it but i was able to pause the action and resume it in a way that hadn't really been done in pinball before so then you kind of get the constant of the music but then you get the interruptions of the pinball action and then back to the movie action in a way that you know now in the game feels pretty seamless. But at first, it was a big uh, technological step to get there. I needed to talk to our systems team to make sure we had the ability to queue up multiple videos, multiple potential videos. And then if you haven't done enough in the game, you'll go to a background like the map, or you'll go to these New York City shots. But the thing was, all this stuff from John Wick looks great on our LCD screen. Um, just the modern filmmaking and the colors just pop out really well. 
You also forgot about one thing that you did a lot, which was counting the number of enemies you would take down in every scene. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have these spreadsheets. These This stuff's all way too boring to make the presentation. <laughs> but I make tons of spreadsheets as well with just, like, tracking every second of the movie, how many enemies are defeated, how they're defeated. Is it a nunchuck? Is it a firearm? Yeah. Is it, you know, whatever he uses. Yeah, you're the expert now, apparently, on the John Wick uh, take takedowns. Oh, this is just a little clip of our first test with the LCD. You can see the um, the the score frame. We want to keep it very simple to show off all the awesome videos. And um, this first test really kind of drove what the background looked like with the 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 awesome uh, aerial shots of New York City and all the other places that we did that they filmed at. Yeah, this is a compilation of every scene transition when they go back to New York. I just montage it all into one video. Mm -hmm. And then I switched it into day and night. And it actually changes when you play the game during the day and at night. It'll change which background you see. <laughs> so now we're getting into more of the details of developing the, uh, the mech. So, you know, we got a great layout now going. So let's start putting fun toys in there. Uh, one of the concepts I had uh, kind of early on, which was he's battling constantly against enemies but it also uses a lot of cars so he's driving a lot he's driving cool cars i mean the iconic ford mustang that he has in the first movie um it's just you know everyone everyone knows that car but he's always in every car against the movie so i wanted to have um it, this sort of like interaction with that uh, and i love the scene i think it's in john wick one where He's driving the car and fishtails towards you, towards the camera, and then it just goes right onto his face. I thought it was such a cool scene, so I want to capture that in a toy. Um, and I wanted it to be really fast, so it was just a surprise that it came out. Um, and we started developing this. I was working with Rob on this, and we initially went with this uh, screw-type mech. Um, and it was actually kind of cool. It's more technical, but it's a five-star lead screw, which is a very fast lead screw. Um, but this is our first test of it. And you can see it's very slow. We wanted to be a lot faster than that. <laughs> but this is this is him actually driving it by hand. This is the first one with actually uh, Tim driving it. Um, initially, it was driven with a stepper motor. So you can see it was going in many different positions. Um, we tested this for a long, long time to make sure this would work. And there was, there was complications with it. Um, not to go super technical, but complications with it on the software side. So we ended up abandoning it and going for more of a DC motor. Um, and then this is another fun fact is uh, George Gomez actually sculpted this car for us. He made it all in 3D for, for us, um, part of our fleet of cars that he's made for us now, the GGMCs, the George Gomez Motor Company. Um, now this is another CAD update. So this is after we played it a bunch. Um, I moved the car over from the center because I wanted it initially featured, but we ended up hitting it way too much, and it would just been like beat to, you know, oblivion. So I wanted to switch over the center ramp and that. So this is the iteration between getting that. Now you can see the crate getting in there, and developing that. Um, and this is our final white wood that we built before we essentially do what we call our design validation. So this is the where we essentially have all of the features in the game. You know, Tim will be really happy because he gets everything at this point. He can start playing with the drivers, the devices, all of that sort of stuff, and actually getting developing rules for it. And then now Randy's off, you know, in cabinet. We're doing cabinet arc, and so this was his first compilations of what those look like. Um, he was really trying to incorporate the stainless, uh, or not stainless, the... Um, stained glass. Yeah, stained glass, sorry, thank you. Uh, the stained glass look for the cabinet, and it just, we went through several iterations with him, and it just wasn't working out. Um, so we ended up going with the uh, the scene from John Wick 4 with the, uh, in the church with Kane. I think that turned out pretty nicely. Here's a quick update with the back glasses. So this was our... We had another concept with this broken glass that we ended up abandoning. And then here's the progress on the uh, stained glass version. And then now, now we're engaging um, another artist actually for the uh, play field because Randy was still tied up with the other, con other concepts of the cabinet. Uh, we actually um, engaged um, oh, 
Kevin. Like he, yeah, Ke Kevin O'Connor uh, has been in pinball industry forever. Um, he was amazing to work with, and he just got it right away, which was awesome to have. So he's like, okay. I told him I knew I wanted the like John Wick in the bottom side, bottom that he's got to be big. And I was referencing that IMAX poster yet again. I'm like, this is a really cool scene. I want enemies like kind of around him, so you know he's the he's the star. And so he got that right away. He started compilating this stuff, and he put this awesome swipe with uh, scenes from the movie. I thought that turned out pretty nicely. Um, and now this is where we get into the marker. So this is where the, 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 this is actually the the photograph of the movie prop here. So an interesting thing on the movie props is they actually make so many different movie props. So this was one that was actually um, they could I forget what they called it. Do you remember what they called it? Joe, do you remember what they called this uh, prop? It was the prop that doesn't open. So yes. there's an open version and there's a closed version. This is the closed version. Yeah, yeah. So this was the one they actually used for um, for film for filming, like the actors would hold, and it wasn't something that they would open up. Um, so I didn't actually have the inside of it, but I was able to um, scan. We were able to scan the outside and then kind of uh, infer what the inside looks like. So this is the um, early development of the marker over here, and I didn't have any decals, so I ended up putting the life ring in there. You can see a lot of stealing stuff from Jaws. And if we didn't have this stuff, we'd just be freezing the movie and trying yeah. to get it as best as possible. This saves us so much time. This was awesome. Um, so now now we're in the final stage. This is just minor tweaks to the layout. Um, we went back and forth on how this crate would progress, um, how this would position. So this is where we ended up with the crate position, um, just kind of getting those final tweaks to make sure it, it performs well. Here's a little picture of our design validation. So this is all the, the games lined up. So we make several prototypes. So it goes to all sorts of programmers like uh, Josh and Tim get both get a game. So you have to make those. And so that's what those look like. Um, another kind of interesting thing, you see kind of this pattern on the, the plastics. We usually paint the plastics so we see what the light looks like. And we don't have artwork at this time. So we're just painting random colors. and. <clears throat> Our, our lab tech loves to make his own kind of fun artwork. So our code name for this game was Waffles. And so he actually put a waffle print in all of our plastics and different in different things. And then for Rush, he actually did maple leaves. So I thought that was kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. So this is a, a picture where we first actually got the artwork. So this is an actually a screened play field. We actually cut up like a... Um, copy of the artwork that we printed out and put it on top and just to see what it would look like in, in full scale. And this is where uh, George actually got involved, you know, pretty, um, he had this great idea to, he wanted to emphasize the uh, neon, what we call the neon noir look of it. So we're like, how do we do this? And so he came up with this idea of, well, what if we ed put all these edge glow stuff around all of these awesome buildings that you got and bottom areas. And we actually, I think for the, for our first time is we actually did a full like um, edge lit uh, plastic set that goes around the game. I think it gives it a cool like dynamic look. And then the the thing that we do too, and this is started early on, is this, this is all the test fixtures we we um, we make. So we want to make sure all the 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 mechs actually test really well and. Um, Lasts as long as the game la or last, uh, uh, you know, lasts a long time. So these are set, uh, pictures. Are there videos? No, I don't. Ha I didn't take any videos, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so we have a room at Stern that literally is just running constantly. It's very noisy, but it's co just running these pinball tests and they're just bashing things all over and over and over again. Uh, we call it the click bang room, and it's just it's a ruckus. And when we're programming these test fixtures, so they're kind of like mini puzzles. So like for example, on the uh, the far right is the test fixture for the crate, and basically I was given a uh, white wood play field, a blank play field with the crate mechs, and the goal is, you know, we're stress testing to make sure these mechs are the most reliable they could be. Mm -hmm. So I would get a document saying, so basically these things run on constant cycles all the time, so the document would say, like, you know, hold the crate coil open for X number of seconds, and, you know, you can program it so that there can be an adjustment for the engineers to adjust or you know, fire the crate uh, some number of times or adjust the coil strength. And we can also print that data on a screen because we have like a test fixture hooked up to an LCD. And that's the data that helps make sure that these mechs are 
you know, sustaining a lot of abuse, especially when they're out on location. And uh, that was kind of a fun project to work on. Yeah. Isn't the first thing you did for us? Was that create test picture? No, I think that might have been. Yeah. So now we're at the final final stages of the game here. So this is where our, fi uh, our final product um, is a pro uh, Ellie on your left here, premium on the center, and the pro on the right is what the um, ended up looking like. And then this is the the final actual first uh, LE build that we ever did um, is sitting in our um, prototyping lab. And then this is me with the first LE we actually ever shipped. So I thought that was cool. I was uh, very proud at this point. <laughs> um, I think this is... Yeah, here's just some other people who worked on the game. I identified 47 unique creative contributors from our entire team. Bill of Materials, Electronics, LCD team is huge now, our software team, our audio team. Of course, Charlie had his partner Andy, too, to help right. him. So, you know, everyone mm -hmm. um, makes an impact on the game. And now I think we're at the end of our presentation, but this was this was such a cool moment for me and I think for Tim as well, uh, was Keanu Reeves actually playing our game at Comic-Con. Um, it was, he was really enjoying it. and. <laughs> <laughs> he can and he play was pinball. making. You can tell he's yeah. played a lot of pinball too. The way he was playing, he really, you know, he, he was like, "Look at that!" As yeah, he gets yeah. the shot. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. Oh, right here. No, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh yeah, they're gonna take this. Um, yeah. I have, there you are. I have, that's me with the jaw shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, what was that? So, uh, I mean, I've I've mm, known Keanu. He was in one of our Anthrax videos back in 2003. And he's always been a great guy. And I I remember telling Jody that he was a pinball fan too. So when he came over to play, he was just focused on, on the game and he was just having a great time. And everybody was just like trying to get a piece of wick. <laughs> <laughs> but it was uh, it was a moment. And I think it was uh, one of the biggest moments at Comic-Con that, that, uh, for that weekend. It was a... Uh, great achievement <laughs> to have wick actually play the wick game yeah that yeah. was awesome so yeah um i think we're at the end of our presentation do you have any uh questions uh i just have a quick question on um where do you see some of the future code updates if you can share like what uh, what you're planning to do it. I, I really like the last update that you guys did that made a world of difference for me playing and especially with all the added new music too, that was killer. Yeah, I got a lot of work to do still. I mean, I've done a lot of work, but I got a lot of work to do. So, you know, I've got a roadmap that I've given to the producers on our team. And one of the big things is like, we had a first pass on a lot of stuff and it's been time to take it to the second level, right? So. The enemies were there, but we made them a lot better with the allies in the past update. And the car multiball has been there, but we're really taking that to the next level. And the next update, we're going to add that button rule. So to describe it, I know it's cooler when you play it, is the button rule lets you play as Kane, the blind assassin. And you hit the button, you turn all the lights off, you get double scoring, of course. And if you add up more buttons, you have different doorbells you place on the shot. So when enemies go by, that shot lights up, and now you can see what shots you have available it's going to be cool. Plus, I'm working on the topper, which nice. Elliot had just worked on. It's going to be really nice. Can't show you any pictures it's yet, coming but soon. it's going to be awesome. And then our wizard mode plan. We've got three really cool wizard modes coming. We've got some more updates to the adversaries. we got some more updates to the, the jobs and the factions will have different things. So we do have a big roadmap. I look at the game and I just go, this is going to be so cool, <laughs> but i got to do all the work. But it's going to be so cool. <laughs> And the glass shatters. <laughs> <in your head>. <laughs> <laughs> hey there. Um, well, first off, congrats to you and the team. The game is awesome. Um, there's a lot of love in the community for like extra modes. I mean, Jaws. You know, there's been you know, there's extra modes and things to do. Any plans in the future to do extra modes for those of us in the home? There's you know, as you know, quite a few people have these pins in their home. We love extra modes. Yeah, so the first extra mode you're going to get is actually um, associated with the topper. So without spoiling it, the topper has done something with timing that's different than any other 
game ever, which means that it's going to be a really long experience that's going to be very different, and you're going to be able to play that either through gameplay, not in competition because it's just for one player, or in a challenge mode. And uh, I think you'll be excited by that. You'll also be excited by the wizard modes we have. We have obviously on the play field the staircase, right? It's just a natural endless wave mode where you got three lives to, to climb the top of the staircase. Can you get there before going all the way back to the bottom, resetting, that sort of thing? So that will also be a really cool standalone mode we're going to add. So um, I have a WIC premium, and I just want to tell you I freaking love this game. And I have 12 pins in my collection, and this one by far gets the most play. Um, so kudos to all of you guys. You did an incredible job. And the music, man, that pumps you up. Something fierce. <laughs> it really does. It gets you dancing around. It's crazy. Um, I have a little it, practice. <laughs> yeah. So my, my question, um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one, it's kind of an odd question, but Winston, when you spell it out, uh, how come you, you spelled out all of them except for the last Letter, are you going to do something where we have to go back and spell the rest of them? Yeah, I'm, I'm changing that for the next update. So you're going to start back, but also we wanted you to be able to overspell Winston because that's going to add your progress to the next multi ball. Okay. So that's kind of one of the things where it's like it's first pass, it works, we got it shipped, and it's time to revisit right. some of those rules to take that to the next level. And then my, my last part uh, question was so they're going to. Obviously, there's a whole WIC universe, um, and I know you got. You just said you're going to have more updates constantly coming. Are you going to be incorporating the the ongoing WIC universe with these updates, or how does that wor work if you even try that? <laughs> Probably. We did hear, um, you know, incorporate Ballerina. What can we – just incorporate it. <laughs> so – Maybe that'll be something, right? It's like that's a future movie in the John Wick franchise. They really have big plans. I don't know if you've seen John Wick. There's like an animated TV show coming, a live action TV show or a streaming series coming. So they really are going to build this huge universe. I don't have access to that, right? We're just humble pinball developers. We were very privileged to see John Wick 4 early. I do have one quick story about the music, and this is my fault. I had put in like a vamping part of your music one of the electronic songs on ball one and we had sent it out to Lionsgate the game and a bunch of executives were standing around we're like why does it keep playing this tone over and over again I'm like oh my gosh I gotta you know update that it was just like something I put in day one and uh, Jody called me screaming <laughs> so I fixed that right after <laughs> you, you just imagine the room of like eight suits looking around the game they're like how come it's always that song and they're not playing too far in the game to start any <laughs> mode? So, you know, they're just getting the same thing. Hey, how you doing? You said, do you hear this? <laughs> and then you put your phone up to their phone. And you're like, Why'd you do that, Tim? <laughs> that was how the conversation went. I got a couple <laughs> questions as an, as an operator. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the people that, uh, that play my game are not, like, super, like, hardcore, like, no really good pinball players, but honestly, your game is really hard. <laughs> 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 so um, I call it real slippery. Um, I think ball time is probably like less than a minute and a half, maybe. Um, I just was wondering if there are going to be any updates that are going to make it a little more, the game a little more approachable to the casual people, because there's a lot of en enemies you have to get through to finish, you know, like a mode. Like if you're going through, you know, Bowery or whatever mode or yeah. our key so it's it could be pretty difficult or so yeah as the game much. comes out with every update i mean there's sometimes where the game is and where people have expectations and it is and right now a lot of people do expect that that adversary mode is the payoff of of getting through the first aspect of the game and i do want to push that a little bit later i want it to be a bigger payoff but i want there to be more intermediate payoffs so one of those things to help with ball times, too, is that we're pulling the car multi-ball right to the front of the game. Yeah. So John Wick Premium, next update, it's going to be hit the nose of the car, hit the side of the car, hit the orbit. You're into the car multi-ball. And that's something that yeah. raises ball time significantly right away. You get it. <laughs> <laughs> Saving pinball right here. <laughs> So, you know, the version number, right, it, you know, it tells you a little bit, right? Like, you know, when, when we have a 1.0 game, we're really 
happy with it as we get there. We're also monitoring that feedback. The contracts have been awesome. We pull the data as well from, you know, when we set a contract, we look at how frequent it is that someone's going to be able to get those objectives and we've adjusted every time. But also we've been learning things from, oh, it's still tough for people to get these enemies. You know, we have to get something that makes that even easier for people. So we, we, we update the game. The average goes up by one or two. Okay, we've got to, you know, make that even even move faster. So there's just constant looking at the data, watching people play, and then adjusting there. So we're definitely on the case of making that a more accessible and enjoyable game at all levels of gameplay. It's all about raising ball time. <laughs> <laughs> you can't raise them too high because yeah. then, yeah, there's a, there's a sweet spot. Anybody else? I don't know if you, I know, I, 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 I sometimes read the internet, <laughs> and um, I want you to know that these guys really care about this game, and I think if you followed Stern over the years, sometimes the games might not start out as strong as they end up being, but they all end up being really great, and I know this game's going to be really special, and these guys really care, so thank you for all of you for hanging in there. <laughs> I had a follow-up question. I just didn't want to be hogging the microphone. Um, but it seemed like the whole internet was blowing up about guns. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know if we can talk about that here because it might not be – I don't know. What, what state are we in? Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, here we go. <laughs> We're going to have Jody Dankford, our director of licensing, yes. along oh, with George Gomez, Gomez, to answer this question. Wow. <laughs> Gomez, right. enters the chat. <laughs> All right, so I I think I think you I think you guys have heard heard me say this. If you haven't heard some of the podcasts that I did, I'm I'm going to tell you about this. So yeah, we started down the path with the game, and we actually you know we were, we had all the films, um, and we had all the video in the films, and clearly there's guns in the videos of the films. So we never really thought twice about any issue with guns. Now, somewhere along the line, Randy, Randy Martinez, the artist on the game, submitted a piece of art, and there was, and you know, it was what you would expect: John Wick on the side of the cabinet with a weapon. Mm -hmm. And it came back that, you know, we don't want you to do that; we want you to use blades. And so we were like a little taken aback because we've got all these guns on the video screen. But we said, okay, so, and Jody clarified it. You know, hey, th really, they've got a sensitivity because the games, they view the game as for all ages, and they make a distinction. If you are walking by the game, in their eyes, they don't want, you know, they don't want to see the weapons. If you walk up to the game and you press a start button, you've made a conscious decision to engage with the game, and then they view it differently. Now, we don't make these rules. This is what they tell us that we have to adhere to. So we did talk about it. We were like, okay, what do we do? And at the end of the day, we, you know, we were looking at it and was going, we've got all this video on screen with all the gunplay you could ever want. And you know, I remember sitting with these guys and talking about it and going, yeah, it's not a big deal. Not a big deal. So the internet response in some ways took us back su by surprise because we had sort of looked at it and said, we got all the gunplay in the world on the screen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we so it, it actually took us by surprise to the point where I had to go on podcasts and sort of explain this because people were making up ideas. There's another thing that like got thrown at me a lot, and that is there are John Wick toys. As a matter of fact, we had them in the studio mm -hmm. that had weapons on them. And and people say, well, they have they they allow this, they license this, and every one of those packages has a you know uh, 18 and over uh, adult collector. yeah adult collector disclaimer on it. And we, for whatever reason, fell into the category of product that was you know for all ages. So you know we we deal with all the curveballs that are thrown at us routinely so we just kept moving and at the end of the day i don't honestly i don't know that it made you know that made the game any worse 
Um, it wasn't a political statement from the company. It wasn't any kind of a, you know, I saw all these conspiracy theories about, you know, Tim, Tim and I, Tim and I were laughing, you know, it's like, you yeah. know, we, we, you know, we both grew up in scouts and we were talking about, you know, man, I, sp I've, sp I've probably spent more time on a shooting range than half these people <laughs> that are complaining about these guns. So not a, not a political statement, just, Hey, it's, we do what we need to do. We are the, you know, we are the licensee. So. <laughs> Any more? Yeah, one more question. One more question, anyone? That's it. There we go. Hi, uh, this message is for Charlie. Hmm. Coming from the music world that you were in and this love of pinball, you described a little bit about what that moment was like when you were approached about this sort of thing. You were already built in with a relationship into music and to pinball. People know you for that. So how did that really make you feel in terms of the beginning of the process when it actually dropped and the completion of it? What, what, what was going on? What was going on? Um, it was a challenge. That was the thing because how do I, I mean, making songs for, for the band Anthrax since the start of the band, that comes easy to me. It's, it's a very easy thing, but making uh, music for a pinball game, I didn't know how I was going to translate that from here to to here. Uh, Tim, of course, like I said earlier, helped me helped me out a lot with that. And then my partner Andy Lagas, he um, he also took on some of the responsibility, and we just worked together. Um, but the most important thing is I wanted to make them happy. <laughs> and if if I knew they were happy, then I was on the right path, you know, because. Making music is is such a um, personal thing, you know. You don't know how it's gonna go over. Uh, and I remember him telling me, like on some of the forums and stuff with other games, people are ruthless <laughs> when it comes to like pinball. But I told him, I said, you should read Blabbermouth. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're just as bad, or if not worse. So you you gotta ignore that stuff. You gotta really do what's in your heart and what's up here, and you gotta listen, pay attention, you know, and from what I from what I hear, people really enjoy the music in the game. So that that's the greatest thing. And from there, I did the X Men game too, which was that was a lot of fun too. And mm. now they're gonna hit me with some other stuff too. <laughs> so I look forward to the challenge because it's it's great. Making music is the greatest thing. It makes people happy. Pinball makes people happy too. Yeah. And you incorporate you know o o my background into this game and it's just uh it's it's very metal so <laughs> i was happy and they were happy so thank you yeah. we got david what? <laughs>